Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, and good Sunday morning to you. It's good to have everyone here this morning on this beautiful Sunday. Amen. Good weather out there. The wind has died down, and we are no longer being blown all over Greene County, which I am glad of. So we are going to start a new Bible study this morning in our Sunday school class, and I'm really excited about this. The Bible study is simply titled Exploring God's Word, and uh, this is a, a wonderful Bible study. I've taught it many times, and uh, I, I'm just really looking forward to this. It's going to cover many, many of the main events and topics throughout the Bible. If you want to know more in detail, we can get into that on a personal level. Uh, but we're going to just go through this, and we're going to get into the Word of God. It's, uh, I'm not sure that we'll get through every lesson every Sunday. It might take us a couple Sundays to get through one lesson, but we're not in a hurry. Because God's Word is a blessing to us. Amen? The Bible says in Psalms, David wrote, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so it's important to read and to know the Word of God and to study the Word of God. And so we're going to get into this, and we're going to start just by an introduction to the Old Testament. So as we look into the Old Testament, and we're going to talk a little bit about the books of the Old Testament and kind of how it's laid out. But first, just as we look into this, we have to understand that there's some time periods. And hopefully you can see these charts pretty well. Um, but there's some time periods that just help us more easily understand, maybe, as a simple way to realize some major events just in a better way. So the first time period that you would cover as you get into the Word of God is a time of innocence. And that's a time of Adam and Eve. And in that innocence, during the creation of man, God put them in a garden, man and woman together. He put them in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. One thing that we know for sure about this time of innocence is that we don't know how long they were in there. <laughs> so while Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they were created in innocence. Amen? They were just in there. We're going to talk a little bit about that, how God dealt with them. And again, the length of time that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, we don't know. So while they were in there, they were protected. That was a paradise for them. And everything, the Bible doesn't talk about what went on outside the Garden of Eden. So I know that a lot of times people ask questions about certain things in the history of the earth. And one thing that we know is that God put man inside a garden to dress it, to keep it, to be provided for, protected. And everything outside was outside and they stayed in that area, but we don't know for how long. Now, the next time frame that you would go into where diff event, different events begin to happen would be the time of conscience. And the time of conscience really covers from the fall of man, that's from when Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit, and it covers to the time of Abraham, one of the first men that God began to deal with in saying, I want a relationship with you. And Abraham, of course, is the father of Israel, known as the father of faith, and that is the beginning of the patriarch. So that time of conscience covers what happened between when Adam and Eve sinned all the way to the time of Abraham. Amen. The next time frame would be the time frame of the patriarchs. Again, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, different men uh, that God dealt with in his relationship with them and situations that happened during the time of patri the patriarchs. That goes from Abraham all the way to the time of Moses when the children of Israel are in the land of Egypt and Moses is their deliverer to bring them out. And then the fourth time period would be the time of the law and the prophets. And that goes from Moses all the way to Jesus Christ. And in that time, God gave his law. He gave his men and women that prophesied to Israel. And that extends from, again, from the time of Moses to Jesus Christ. And so in this first lesson, we're going to cover the events from creation until the first judgment. So as we look at the books of the Old Testament, when you look through the, the Bible, the Bible has 66 books in it. And we know that there are two parts to the Bible that we uh, can kind of separate it into, and that's the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we have to realize 
that the Bible is the Word of God. Amen? It's not just a book written by men. In fact, 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And 2 Timothy 3.16 agrees with that. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And that's where those scriptures come from. But they cover all scripture, right? They cover because when Peter and when Timothy or when Paul rather were writing these, they were talking about the law and the prophets because the New Testament was not yet written and put together yet. So when they're talking about all scripture, they're talking about anything that was inspired by God. And that word inspired means God breathed. It wasn't written by men. It wasn't by the will of man. It wasn't by the wisdom of man. But it was what God wanted to author in his own book, and he moved upon men to write those words down. So was the Bible penned by men? Yes. Show me a book that wasn't. Right? But they were men that were moved by God. God breathing upon them, breathing through them, spirit moving upon them to give them inspiration to write the word of God. So though it was penned by men, it is the word of God. And because it's the word of God, it means that it is infallible. It is without fault. It is without error. It is absolutely perfect. Amen. That word uh, in 2 Peter one twenty one says, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, that kind of means, that word moved means to be carried along. Kind of like if you were to put a, a ship out on the ocean, the wind would carry it along and just kind of move it. The Spirit of God moved upon them, carried them in the direction God wanted them to go. So when we look at the Word of God, because it is His Word, we need to approach that with reverence. Amen? Now, when I say reverence, I don't mean that quiet piety and folded hands necessarily all about our outward expression, but I mean with a respect in our heart to God's word, understanding that it's his word and that we should not take it lightly. Amen? We need to know the word of God. And we need to understand that because it's his word and not the word of men, every word is important. I remember in junior high, I've shared this story many times. I had a math teacher, Mrs. Hoover, and uh, I saw her just a, a few weeks ago, actually, in a store. And she was my one of my favorite teachers in middle school, though she was a tough teacher. And she was a math teacher. But I remember when we used to have math books, right? When we had a hardcover book that we took home and we had to take the, the we used to use pick and save grocery bags for the outside cover. You had to make the book cover. Remember that? Dating ourselves. And I remember her telling us, because somebody misread instructions or didn't follow instructions, she said, everything in this book, from cover to cover, is written there for a purpose. None of it is just candidly written in there. It's not without reason. So whether it's a page number, whether it's the index or, or the reference points or, or the mathematical problems, everything in there is for a purpose. And when I came to know Jesus a little bit better, and when I began to uh, be taught the Word of God and understand it a little bit better, I thought, well, if that's true for a Macmillan math book, how much more for the Word of God? Amen? And so God's Word is important. And God warned Moses in Deuteronomy 4 and 2, You shall not add to the Word that I command you, neither diminish anything from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Proverbs 30 and 6 is similar. It says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now I think many of us would probably say, that, well, I wouldn't take a Bible and, and add pages to it and add scripture to it, or I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't delete things from, you know, a Bible. And, and I don't know that's necessarily talking about that. I think it's talking about when we know and understand the Word of God, we are to follow what we know and understand and not say, well, that doesn't apply to me. And I'm going to make some own, my own rules for me. I've talked, I remember an individual one time, and uh, he had a situation in his life that was very tough. He had lost a child. And I was trying to minister to him and witness to him a little bit. And he says, well, me and God have an agreement. Well, as tough as the situation was and as, as hurtful as that was, 
you, that's not the way it works. He might have had an agreement, but God's agreement is in his word. He's given us his word. It says in Revelation 22 and 19, If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's pretty powerful. And so we have to preserve God's word. It tells us again in Psalms 12, 6, and 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver in a furnace of the earth is tried, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord, you shall preserve them from this generation forever. So God didn't just give us his words. He promised to preserve his words. Because God wants everyone to have access to him. Amen? He wants us all to be able to come to him. Jesus said that it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. And that tittle is just a small Hebrew mark that they use in their writing. So God gave us his word. And as we look into the Old Testament, there are several books uh, that we're going to look at here. And there's an easy method to remember if, you, if you're into this sort of data how many books are in the Old Testament? Anybody know how many books are in the Old Testament without counting up there? There's 39. 39 books in the Old Testament. That's easy to remember because there's three letters in Old and there's nine letters in Testament. So 39. Easy to remember, right? New Testament, the math works out very similar. Three letters in New, nine letters in Testament. Three times nine is 27. 27 in the New Testament. So as we look through the books of the Old Testament, you need to go back a slide. As we look through these books of the Old Testament, you can even see that they are divided up a little bit on here. So it's the inspired word of God. It was written by holy men of God. There's 39 books covering 3,600 years of man's history in this Old Testament. It took over 1,500 years to complete in writing. And God gave us in this book uh, five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. Israelite men, when they went through school as a youth, had to memorize these books. And so those are the books of Moses that God gave Moses, and that is the law, the Torah of Israel. The next 12 books are books of history. It covers from Joshua all the way through Esther. Then there's five books of poetry, Job through the Song of Solomon. And then the last 17 books are all books of prophecy. Five are called major prophets, and 12 are called minor prophets because of the length of the books. Major prophets are a little bit longer. So it's a powerful, everybody say it's powerful. It can change our perspective of our life when we allow the Word of God to minister to us. So as we look into the creation week in the beginning, there's a couple uh, days here that God begins to do some miraculous things. The very first verse of the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen? It wasn't a big bang. Because chaos does not create order. Throw a grenade into a junkyard, and when it explodes, you're not going to see a, a, a brand new 1957 Chevy all sitting there assembled and painted. An explosion is not, in a pile of junk is not going to create order or matter, Right? God created the heaven and the earth. It was divine, divine order. God created it. The first day, God said, let there be light. And there was light, and he divided the light from darkness. That is not the light from the sun. That, light word, that word light means an illumination. Let there be an understanding. Let there be light. Let there be some order begin to take place. And God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And so the earth was still without form, and it was still void, and there was a mass of waters. And the second day, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from waters. He called the firmament heaven. Today we call it the sky, and it divided the waters from those under it and those above it. So God created these things by his spoken word. Let there be. 
He created things, the Bible says, uh, from things that were not. Now, I can, you give me a, a ball of clay, I can make something. I don't know if you'll recognize it, but I can make something out of it. Give me a square of clay, and I can make a ball of clay. How about that? But God created it from nothing. From his spoken word, he said, let there be, and there was. And so on the third day, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. That's in Genesis 1 and 9. He called the dry land earth and the gathered waters seas. On the same day, God also said, uh, let the earth bring forth grass and herb and yielding seed and the fruit of the trees and after each kind and the seeds in itself upon the earth. So the third day saw the appearance of dry land and the gathering of waters into specific areas and the creation of grass and herbs and trees on the land all because God said let it be let it happen let it take place on the fourth day God said let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons for days and for years and let them be for lights and light of heaven to give light upon the earth so he created the sun and the moon and almost as an afterthought it says he created the stars also just like he said, all right, here's the sun, and here's the moon, and whew, there's the stars. I know that science will teach us that the sun is the center of our solar system, right? Because it's in the center, and everything revolves around it. But God, in his power and in his majesty, created the earth first. So the earth is really the center of God's solar system, because it's where we're at. Because we're the apple of his eye. Amen. On the fifth day, he said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, the fowl that may fly above the earth and the open firmament of heaven. So Genesis 1 and 20, by his spoken word, he created all the fish, every living creature that moves in the water and every bird that flies in the air. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Amen. So he created the fish and the birds. And then the sixth day. He said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind. And it tells us in Genesis 1 and 26, after he created all the animals and the creeping things all over the earth, he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. We're the only ones like that. We're the only ones where he said, we're going to make man after our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created them, male and female, and he said, Be fruitful and multiply, plenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the seas, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Behold, he says, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you he says it shall be for me listen to this and to every beast upon the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life i have given every green herb for meat so there was no carnivores in the beginning okay there were no carnivores. Everything ate. We won't get until after Noah gets off the ark to where God says, you can eat meat. So some things changed then. And, and that's important to understand and to know. The seventh day, what happened on the seventh day? God rested. That's where he established the Sabbath, his relationship with man. And so God rested on the seventh day. So that's the creation time. Maybe we've read that before in the Bible. Maybe we've studied that in Genesis. But it's important to understand some things in that time of creation, that God did all of that through his spoken word. Amen? And Adam and Eve were in that paradise, in the garden. And as you read throughout the Bible, and as we get into, into the, the story of Noah and the ark, everything that they needed was provided for them. Everything that they had need of protection and and, uh, and 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 all of that, the food and everything they had need, God provided. They looked to him for it. Amen? They looked to God for everything. And the Bible even says later on in the story of Noah that 
a mist or a heavy dew went up from the earth. It was like a greenhouse effect, and it watered the face of the earth. It didn't rain, as we're going to find out, until the flood. So God gave all of that to Adam and Eve. So here's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they're living their life there, right? And God gives them this place to live, but as we begin to read in the second chapter of Genesis, these more detailed things of everything where Adam and Eve were, the Garden of Eden, a beautiful place, everything they had need of, he gave them some commandments as well. Because that's what gives us structure in our life, is God's word. And so God told them in Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17, of every tree of the garden you can freely eat. You're in this garden, we don't know how big it was, but we know it was plenteous for them, and they could eat from every tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. So they were to dress the garden, they were to keep the garden. They were to take care of the place where they lived, right? And they could eat from any tree in that place. But there was two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they could not eat, but the tree of life was there that they could eat from. And it's understood that because they could eat from the tree of life, they would live forever. But in the day they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would cease living forever and they would die. And so, as God created Adam first, he saw the man, he saw as he was naming the animals, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And so I'm going to make a help meet for him. It's a word that means an aid. And so he causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he took one of his ribs, and the Bible says he closed up the flesh and from that rib of Adam. Now, Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. God formed him from the, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his life, into his nostrils, the breath of life, the Bible says. Eve was created from one of Adam's ribs. And so Adam declared after Eve was created, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And in their innocence, Adam and Eve were unashamed. And in this garden, they were naked, the Bible says. No need for clothes. Perfect environment, right? Never too cold, never too hot. Everything they had need of. And there were just the two of them walking around in all their glory that God created them in, right? And it was perfectly fine. It was all good. Now, God gives us free will, right? Right? People could say, well, wouldn't it have been better if God wouldn't have given them the opportunity to do wrong? God doesn't, he's not looking for robots, and he's not looking for puppets. It's choice. Everybody say choice. We have a choice on whether or not we're going to serve God every day. We have a choice if we're going to repent of our sins and be baptized in his name and receive the spirit that he's offered to us. We have a choice if we want to enter into that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. He's not going to force us. He certainly wants us to be in that relationship with him, but he wants us to willingly serve him and to love him. So we have free choice because really, I mean, just think about it. If you had somebody in your life that it was mandated that they had to love you and serve you and worship you and, and have that relationship with you, it really wouldn't be much of a relationship, would it? It wouldn't. So as we look at the fall of mankind, and I want to try to get through this today. We've got a few minutes left. There's a couple verses that it's important to look at in the New Testament. Romans 13 and 14 says, Do not make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That means don't put yourself in a situation where we're going to appease this flesh and do something sinful against God. Ephesians 4 and 27 also says, Neither give place to the devil. Don't give the enemy an opportunity to come and attack you. So don't give your flesh an opportunity to fail. Don't give the enemy an opportunity to mess with your mind. So a lot of times situations, hurtful things in our life could be avoided if we stayed away from the environments and those situations that provide for those things, right? 
So they're in the Garden of Eden. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then the Bible says that the serpent entered in. And that's the devil. He came in the form of a serpent. To understand this, you would have to back up. You'd have to read Ezekiel and know that Satan was cast out of heaven. He said, I'll exalt myself above God. Satan was an archangel. His name was Lucifer. Michael is the warring angel. Gabriel is the messenger angel. And Lucifer was the worship angel. You have to know that. Because he was over worship in heaven. The Bible describes him as being beautiful. So when the glory of God would enter in as heaven is worshiping God, uh, that, that glory of God that, who is light would reflect off of Lucifer. He began to think that all of this was him in pride, he rose up and said, I'll be like the Most High. I'll exalt myself above the stars of God. And so because of that, God cast him out of heaven because of his pride. The Bible says his tail of that dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven with him. So all the demons, all the evil spirits we have to deal with are a third of that heavenly host that he also tricked and brought with him as he's cast out to the earth so he was cast out to the earth so now he comes to the garden in the form of a serpent and also in saying that god did not create another worshiping angel he created us to worship him and so because the devil could not destroy god he wants to destroy the image of god and that is you and that is me so he comes in to do this by visiting the garden, and he tempts Eve. He says, hasn't God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden in Genesis 3 and 1? So he's going to question God's word. He will always try to get us to question God's word. Do I really have to do this? Is this really what God means? Is this really what God wants for me? And so he asked, shall you not eat of every tree? And it's very subtle because God said, you can eat from every tree freely, but from this one, the knowledge of good and evil tree, you shall not eat of it. And so Satan just brings out the part, didn't God say you could eat from every tree? And so Eve then, not having the knowledge, because God told this to Adam. So it was whose responsibility to tell Eve? Adam's. So he comes in, and the woman says to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And as soon as the enemy heard this, God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said don't eat of it. And this is important. God did not say that. And so once the serpent, because she misquoted, she revealed a major flaw in her ability to resist because she did not have the word of God to protect her. Once the serpent got her to touch it, and she didn't die, I could almost just imagine him kind of coiling around that piece of fruit and saying, I'm touching it. I'm not dying. So maybe she plucked a piece and she's holding it in her hand. Now she's touched it, and if she thought she couldn't touch it or die, and here she's not dead, Sister Kathy. So what's it going to hurt to take a bite? See, that's what the enemy does. Oh, I can just get in this a little bit here. I'm still fine. I'm still okay. But he knew, and it says that he is attacking God's motives, just little by little the only way to resist the temptations of the enemy is to respond to his efforts with the word of god with the pure word of god just as jesus did and so when when jesus was entering his ministry what did the devil do he tempted him right with and he even said isn't it written he'll protect you if you fall off this mountain even if you trip over a stone he'll protect you so what did Jesus do? He had to come back with the word of God. If Jesus isn't too great to be tempted, we're not either. So look at what Satan does next in Genesis 3, 4, and 5. And I'll get ready to wrap this up. He says, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the days you eat. Now he leaves out touch. He didn't say touch. He says, God knows in the day you eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open. You shall be as God's knowing good and evil so what was he doing he was causing eve to think god was keeping something from her 
And because she could touch it, because she misquoted and didn't die, now she takes a bite. And what happens? The Bible says, Romans 5 and 12, death came by sin, so sin passed upon all men. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. By one man's disobedience and offense, death reigned. So she gave to her husband who was there with her, and he did eat. Right? And so their conscious was awakened. Their eyes are opened, and they know they're naked, and the age of innocence is over. And because of their sin, that nature of sin passed on to all of us, which is why we need a Redeemer. And we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you. We love you, Jesus, for all that you do, for all that you've done. We thank you for your word today, God, and I pray that you'd help us to hide it in our heart, to learn of you, to study of you, God, to take your yoke upon us, God, and to know you, Jesus. We pray that you'd bless this service today, God. Have your way in all things, and everyone said in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Service will start in just a few minutes.
Good morning, everybody. Today is Mission Sunday, so I get the opportunity to share three of our missionaries with you today. I've always heard that some people go by giving. Some people give by going. Well, we're here in our home mission church today, in our home city, right? In our church right here. So we are definitely... We're going by giving. We're giving our money, and that's how we are going into the missionary field. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to actually go with your your whole body and and give your time and your effort, but I have another little challenge, another little challenge to this thought, to go by visiting. Have you ever visited another church? Have you ever done any kind of traveling of any sort? And just visit it. It's not necessarily a mission church. Just visit a church. When, when my kids were younger, actually, just my whole life, I've always done a lot of traveling. And when the kids were really little, we'd go up to Crivets, Wisconsin, quite often. And on Sundays, we'd go visit the Peshtigo Church. It wasn't a small church. It was a great-sized church, and the kids got to experience Sunday school. One Sunday, we even attended their uh, Praise in the Park service. We had potluck and all. It was a great, a great amount of fun. The experiences that we get just to see another church are just such a blessing for us, but we are also a big blessing to the ministry and the people of that church. Now, one year we we went to Phoenix, Arizona, so I googled churches thinking, okay, this is going to be a bigger church than we're used to, and it wasn't. It was a, it was a storefront church. It was in a nice little strip mall. They had a little corner, and the only people in the church were the pastor and his family. I mean, they were so excited to have visitors, and they were so excited to have three more kids in Sunday school than just their kids. You know, so we are, we are such a blessing, not even in a mission field, but yet we are in a mission field by, by just attending and, and loving Jesus with other people that we know believe the same we do. So two years ago, I actually, for the first time, I was very uncomfortable with one of these visits that my husband and I did at a church. We were traveling in Europe, and in London, there was a church two blocks from our Airbnb. So it was a Wednesday night or Thursday night. We walked a few blocks, and we went to visit, and we stood out like a sore thumb. It was very uncomfortable. I think we just, like, smelt American. (laughs) I mean, the way we dress is different. The way we talk, you know, we had an accent, right? (laughs) The London people had an accent, but we had an accent, so we stood out. But the still, they were so welcoming, and they were so excited to, to talk to us and just learn where, where are we from and where are we going. And, and the conversation's always good, but it's not always, it's not always comfortable, and it's okay. It, we need to get out of our comfort zone once in a while. Uh, when we were in Europe, we traveled over to Germany and Portugal and Sweden, and Sweden's way up there. They're like at the same longitudinal level of Alaska, so they have really dark winters and really light summers for long parts of their day. Well, they're right on the Baltic Sea. One of the missionaries that we support, the Potter's House supports, is in Latvia. Do you guys know where Latvia is? Thank you, Charlie. She's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, me? Uh Uh-uh. We got Google Maps, baby. (laughs) Latvia is on the other side of the Baltic Sea from Sweden. So, I mean, they are up there in the, the, you know, kind of pushing toward the Arctic a little bit. They are technically between the countries of Estonia and Lithuania, if that means anything to you. I am so thankful that Brother Dennis and Sister Amy Euchre have a passion for people in Latvia because there are people there. There are people in Latvia. There's people everywhere in this world. And and I'm so thankful for the missionaries that we support and the passion that they have and the opportunity we have to give, to give of our finances. You know, whether they're a large church or a small church, it's always beneficial to, to hear from other people. We have evangelists come all the time, right? But some of these really small churches, they don't have the finances to pay for evangelists. I mean, evangelists have expenses. It's not just free, necessarily, to invite people in. So another group that we support is called Year of Evangelism. And this organization finances for evangelists to come into those smaller churches. People, we, we need to hear from other people. Our pastor needs to hear from other people. And that's where the Year of Evangelism can finance to help their ministries grow and be fed. But, you know, maybe you don't travel. Maybe you haven't been overseas. Maybe you haven't been out of the Midwest. 
Well, thankfully, we have missions right here in Green County. And the third group that the Potter's House finances that I'm going to at least talk about today is Family Promise. They're right here in Green County. They support the homeless. You know, so if maybe you are giving of your finances, but also I challenge you to go by visiting, volunteer your time, make sure that you're, an, you're aware of what, what we have right here and how we really can help, how we can be a blessing. Because, you know, you never know when this is going to give back to you when you need it. It was about eight years ago. It was around Labor Day weekend, and right here at the Potter's House, we had a music group come and minister to us from one of the Bible colleges, and Brother Jason Lucas was part of the music team, and he shared his testimony. He was a missionary kid. He grew up in Japan. Well, at that very moment, my son was in transition from the United States over to Japan because he was in the U.S. Navy, and that was his first station that he was being based in, so of course... I clued in to, to Brother Jason's conversation. And afterwards, I talked to him. I don't know Japan. I don't know the layout. I don't know cities and bases. And I, I don't know. Well, come to find out, the closest church from where my son Jordan was stationed was the Lucas Church. And so Brother Jason gave me his number and his contact and said, have, have him connect with me because you know, Jason's going back over to Japan. So have Jordan connect with me. And, and we do ministry on base. That's one of the things we do. And sure enough, Jordan's home church when he was in Japan was the Lucas Church, and we're still connected with them today. And Jordan was able to connect with Jason, and there was, there was a great opportunity to serve. So you never know when your money, when, you're, when your prayers are going to come back and bless you abundantly when you least expect it. So today, as we, as we focus on missions, can we pray together for our local missions right here in Greene County, Pray for the year of evangelism that supports educating and, and helping mission churches grow. And pray for that Latvia church, Brother Dennis and Sister Amy um, Euchre, as they bless people we don't know, but you never know when we will. Can we pray together? and we thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing all over the world, that we have an opportunity to worship God. God, through giving, God, through prayers, Lord, I just pray that you would reach out and touch these people, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would minister to the family promise, God, people that are in need right here, Lord Jesus, in our great county, God, that you would touch, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you be glorified. Can we just lift up a shout of praise to God? God, you are good, you are great, and we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in this place. God, I pray that, Lord Jesus, as we begin to worship you, that there would be a resounding praise that's God lifted up in this place, that faith would arise and that you would be glorified in Jesus' name.
Lift up your voice and your praise to Jesus this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, let's clap our hands to him, church. Let's give him the glory today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Our ushers could come. I have a few announcements that I want to share. Of course, Mother's Day coming up next Sunday. There are invites, so please grab one of those out by the Welcome Center. If there's somebody you would like to give a special invite to and let them know they are welcome to come to that service on Mother's Day, May 9th. There's no evening service uh, because of that holiday. There's no evening service. We want people to be able to spend time together with family. And so uh, please remember that. And then coming up on May 23rd, it's Pentecost Sunday. A couple special things about that day. It's the birthday of the church. Acts chapter 2 is when the Holy Ghost was poured out on the New Testament church, and it began. We are having that day at 10 in the morning, Brother Rufus Parker, to be with us. He pastored in La Crosse, Wisconsin. He was a missionary in Okinawa, Japan. He served in our military. He is a walking Bible. He is a man of God, and you will be blessed by his ministry. There are invites also of these out on the Welcome Center. Please grab some and invite somebody to that service and make sure you, you yourself are faithful to that service. He's going to teach in the morning and then he's going to preach at 1030, uh, doing both services. And I'm looking forward uh, to the word of God from this man. He's a mentor of mine and I love him dearly. Uh, him and his wife are great friends of our family. So please come and support that service. Also on the same invite on the right side is announcing our 6 p.m. live stream for Save Our Nation. We also have these little business cards for Save Our Nation. If there's somebody that maybe they're not nearby, but they're a friend of yours or a family member, I have about 1,500 of these. Take as many as you'd like and promote this. It's got the website on the back. They can live stream it in their living room. They don't have to be here. Um, but we are looking forward to having... Uh, to hosting that event here and to having as many people come as possible. Amen? And then also on the 30th of this month is our fifth Sunday social. We are going to have a potluck. Woohoo! Woo and there's no evening service on that Sunday night either because of Memorial Day holiday. But there's a sign-up sheet for the potluck. Bring something delicious to, that you would like to share. And we're going to have a great time that day. Pray for good weather. We can have some games afterwards outside and some fun things to do that day. So, amen. 
appreciate Sister Kathy sharing Mission Sunday with us today. And I will be during, uh, after I step down here from announcements, be handing out some um, certificates to people that are supporting currently for Mission Sunday. But if you would like to support, we do have a new family that we are supporting through the church, Todd and Ann Bauman, Metro Missionaries to Boston, Massachusetts. If you'd like to support them at $25 a month, that would be wonderful. Let me know after service. And also during ministers' conference, we had some pledges, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago. We pledged $1,000 to save our nation for the event in Milwaukee that we're going to support. If you would like to give to that, you can just write Save Our Nation on your offering envelope. Um, campgrounds up north in Wisconsin where we have family camp, junior camp, youth camp every year. Are, they're redoing the campgrounds. We donated or committed $500 to that and then also $500 to the Elfins uh, to get them back to Finland. Amen. So if you would like to donate to those, it's about $2,000 that we've committed to and uh, we would appreciate your support in that. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to bless this offering this morning. Brother Mike, would you please pray? Yes, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. We want you, Lord, like 
We just invite him to be our shield and our strength, our present help in time of need, everywhere at once, an ever-present God. Yes, Jesus, right on time, God. Yes, in all your need, God. He's in all your needs, God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, he is for you. times in the Word of God, when you get done reading a passage of Scripture, it will say amen. It just means so be it. A lot of times when we get done praying, we say amen. So be it. Let it be, God, according to your will. I want God's will. I want God's will. A lot of things we pray about, a lot of things we request for God, a lot of situations that cause us concern and worry or rejoicing. I want God's will. I want God's will for this nation. I want God's will for our community. I want God's will for His church, for everything that's going on, everything we're dealing with with in this present age. I want the will of God, the will of God. The most important place we could ever find ourselves, church, is right in the middle of the will of God. Can we lift up our hands? Can we lift up our voice right now and just invite His will, His presence, His sovereignty into our life, into our heart? Jesus, we need Your will, God. We want Your will. Lord God, You are perfect. You are holy and righteous. And there is no one like you, God. And we want your will today in this service, God. We want your will for our future and our eternity, God. We want your will, God, for our families and for our children and for their children and their children, God. And we want your will, God, for our health and our communities, God, and for our finances, God. We want your will, God, in reaching the lost of our communities, God. We want your will, God, for your blessings and the manifestations of your spirit in your church. We want your will, God. We want your will, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. 
Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. We're going to open with that. I do want to say just a very public and a very gracious thank you to the individuals that were able to help with the stones in the parking lot islands. Um, Thank you so much. Yes, by all means, round of applause. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. We had a quad axle, quad axle dump truck full of inch and a half rock, a two inch rock. I think he said it was about six tons. And I'm also very thankful to uh, Bard Materials. They donated half of that. So very thankful for that. And uh, I showed up at nine o'clock. I got a few calls from people. Some said what time they could come. And I understand with people working. And I thought for sure this was going to be all weekend. So yeah, by all means, show up tonight. We'll be here this evening, you know. And uh, I was starting, and I put down my first piece of plastic and threw a couple shovelfuls of rock on there. And I thought, man, that's going to be a big job, right? And then all of a sudden, I see Brother John come down the highway. I think he honked. And uh, he's got a little trailer behind his truck and a little bucket tractor in the back of that. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) So he came. We unloaded that. We get started. He had to take the trailer back. And so we were there, and uh, I was... Brother Brian Swedland was able to come, and so him and I are getting started. And then all of a sudden, Brother Scott Golaxon comes driving in on this little green John Deere with a bucket on the front. He was driving by. He saw me all by my lonesome right in the beginning with a shovel. He thought, no, no, that's that we can't do that. So <laughs> thank you, Sister Dee Dee, for letting him use your tractor, for letting us use your tractor. And so... And Derek was able to show up. Ethan was able to show up. Jamie was able to be there for a while. And uh, so through about six of us, we knocked it out in four hours, three hours, nine to, yeah, nine to one, somewhere in there. Yes, amen. Three, three to four hours. Yes, very much appreciated. Appreciated. And I uh, had Paul and Mark both contacted me later, said, hey, I can show up. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. But I'm also glad that we don't have to, <laughs> that we're done. So thank you for being willing to help. And uh, But it went very quickly. It went well. So praise God. The biggest uh, relief about that is that for the mowing team, we no longer have to mow those islands. <laughs> because if you've never done that, you will never understand. <laughs> Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12 through 16. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You cannot fool God. You can tell God whatever you want to, but you might as well tell him your heart. Sometimes there's things we don't know that God tells us about our heart. God's telling you something about your heart, and you say, well, that don't seem right. It's right. You just haven't got there yet. His word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Might as well be honest with God. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are revealed to him. All things, it says, are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our struggles. He knows about it but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly, everybody say boldly, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Today I just want to preach for a little bit about words with power to change. Words with power to change. Let's lift up our voice together and our hearts to him. Jesus, we need you so much. 
We need you in this place, God. Help us today, God. We're crying out to you, God. We're dependent upon you, Jesus. We need you, God. We can do nothing without you. You are our help and our strength and our present help in time of need, God. We ask today, Lord, that you'd come into this place. We invite your presence to abide here in our praises, in our worship, in our thanksgiving, God. For you are good and your mercy endures forever. Don't turn your back on us today, God, but hear our cry, Lord God, as we repent of our sins, as we turn from our wicked ways, God, that you would hear from heaven and forgive us, God, and pour out your spirit today as our hearts are open to you. Allow your word to minister to us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, God, for your word declares that it is, Lord God, from you, Jesus. It's given by you and it's profitable for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for doctrine, for reproof. God, it's a help to us, a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. Lord, let it minister to us today as we receive it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Have you ever heard something, maybe a statement, maybe you read it, somebody said it, whatever it was, but it, it had an impact on your life? Maybe it was a quote that somebody said that really just made you think about things. I I love reading quotes of uh, wise men and women of our past and of our present. I I enjoy reading that when God gives somebody just a nugget that's inspirational or encouraging or instructional. Amen? One of my favorites is from uh, a past president who said there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. I like that. There's nothing wrong with the world that can't be fixed what's, with what's right with the world, right? Amen. And so we hear things, people say things, and they have an impact on our life. They encourage us. Maybe it's a small word. Maybe it's just a small gesture, a statement, a thought, or a question that was Profound, and that it began to minister to you, it helped you, it lifted you up, or it provoked some thought. Well, can I share with you today that the Word of God, the words of Jesus Christ that we find between the covers of this book, that God has poured out to us, that He inspired men to write it and to give to us, that it is an infallible Word of God, as we talked about this morning. It has the power to change our life. Come on, somebody. The Word of God has the power to change our life. We're hesitant to say that or to be agreement with it because we know then we have to apply it. But the Word of God can change us. Certainly when we're filled with His Spirit, which is for everyone, God wants to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. It's for all generations. The promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, the Holy Spirit, God's gift that he wants to pour out on us to put his spirit in our hearts and our lives. It is for everyone, and with that, it does minister to us and change us, doesn't it? He said, I'll put a new heart and a new spirit within you. So certainly the Spirit of God does change us. But before that takes place, there has to be a word that comes to us. Amen? There has to be a word of God that is shared with us. I can remember even just in my own testimony, I had always uh, been been raised going to Sunday school and and reading through uh, Bibles uh, for my age as I was growing up and and being familiar with stories and individuals and, and situations throughout the Bible. But I remember when I was working at Advanced Transformer and an individual came up to me and began ministering to me about being born again, about being baptized in Jesus' name and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And it changed my life. It was the Word of God, and it had an impact what He said, those words to me that day, so strongly that immediately after after I was done with work and I got home, I went and I found my Bible, and I turned to the passage in the, the second chapter of Acts that He was telling me about, and I began to read it, and those words began to minister to me to the point where I said, I need this, I want this, I don't want to go another day without this. And from that point forward, it changed my life. Amen. I think we all have a testimony that we could share that would tell us something very, very similar about how the Word of God 
has changed us. Our opening verse says that it is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It can divide asunder soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and discern the thoughts and intents of our heart. Amen. Amen. So we might as well be honest with God because he wants to minister to us. What he has is for us, and he is on our side. He says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of good, not of evil, thoughts to give you an expected end, he says. Amen. He is a good God, and he tells us in his word that if we don't have faith, we cannot please him. So faith is important in our lives. So we have to ask ourselves, where can I receive this faith? Where can I have my faith added to? Where can I get more faith in my life? Well, it tells us in the word of God in Romans chapter 10 and 13, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then, he asked, shall they call on him whom they not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But listen to verse 16. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah said, the Lord uh, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing. Everybody say by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I cannot do, I cannot put into action what I don't know. But as I am instructed, as I read, as I learn, as I am taught, then I can put into action, I can uh, uh, begin to apply that which I'm being taught, and then my faith is increased. So faith comes through the word of God. There's so many stories in the Bible about people, individuals, men and women that were forever changed when they heard the words of Jesus Christ. They were forever changed just by the words of Jesus. We talked about in our Bible study this morning in our Sunday school class how the word, uh, the word of God framed the worlds that God said and it was. So the word of God is powerful, has the power to create, has the power to transform. There's an individual in the Bible, he was a religious leader in the days of Jesus Christ. His name was Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee and he was a teacher of the law. He was well respected among uh, many of the people in Jerusalem. And whenever he would go to places, he would be welcomed and he would be respected. He met Jesus by night. In one encounter. And he said, teacher, we know that you are a man come from God because no one can do the miracles that you're doing unless God's with him. And Jesus just said this to him in John three and three. Verily, verily, or most assuredly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that provoked a question, and that entered into a conversation, and those words of Jesus changed this religious man's life forever. The, the words of Jesus ministered to Nicodemus. It changed him uh, from being more concerned about with what was going on in the religious world than with his sect as a Pharisee, and, and it changed him to want to know more about Jesus, more about who God truly was and what God's plan was for Israel. The words of Jesus changed him. He could have gone back to the first statement about Jesus' miracles. He came there with the intent to meet with Jesus, with the intent to talk with Jesus, and he begins by paying him a compliment. We know you're from God. No one can do what you're doing unless God is with him. And Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And sometimes we're like that. And Well, but yeah, but your miracles... And the cool things and, and, the, and the deliverances and the healings, I mean, man, those are incredible. He didn't do that. He didn't go back to his conversation, but he listened. He listened to the words of life. He could have digressed back to what he originally began to speak about, but instead he allowed the words of Jesus to change him and led him from statements about Jesus to questions for Jesus. 
Amen. Here was a man who was a religious leader in Israel, a man who should have it all together, a man who others looked to and, and was a teacher and a minister to people who were in need, a man that they called upon when they had a struggle or a question about the Word of God or when they had a need in their life. Here was a, a man that people looked up to and, and somebody that was supposed to be able to minister to other people, and yet the words of Jesus changed him forever. I don't think that we could ever think or we should ever think that the word of God can't change us, that it can't minister to us, that it can't help us. And it doesn't matter what part of it we're reading, if we will get into it. Now, don't get me wrong. I realize that if I just open it once a day and I and I just read, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, we want a king over us. And I close it. Yeah, that might not mean a lot to me. But you know what? And, and please, this is not this is not me trying to pat myself on the back because I know there's others that can say the same thing. See, I can take that one passage and I can tell you that Samuel was a prophet in Israel and Samuel was leading Israel and ministering to the people. But yet the people came to him and they said, Samuel, you're getting old. And guess what? Your sons don't walk in the ways of God. They're, 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 they're sons of Belial. They're evil boys. They're not doing. And so we're not going to have a, a judge. We're not going to have a prophet over us anymore. So we want a king like the other nations. And the saying displeased Samuel. And Samuel was angry. But God said, no, give them what they want. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So Samuel went to where God had told him to, and he found Saul, the son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, and he anointed him to be king over Israel. We should be able to get that from that one verse. Because we've been in the word of God and allowed it to change us. And from that we understand that it's not earthly leadership that we should always be looking to, but it's godly leadership that we should be looking to. Sovereign leadership, a deity that we have in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8 and verse 10, we read into this story about this woman who the religious leaders found, and she was, I don't know how they came across this situation. Uh, I, the Bible doesn't explain how they knew about it, but they found this woman, and she was in the act of adultery. She was in the act of infidelity in her marriage. And so they grabbed her and they pulled her and they threw her at the feet of Jesus. And they said, this woman was caught in the very act. Now the law of Moses says she should be stoned. And they're tempting Jesus. So what do you say? And so the Bible tells us in verse 10 that Jesus lifts himself up because he knelt down and he was riding in the, in the sand and then after he had written in the sand for a while, he, he says to those men that were accusing this woman who had caught her, she was guilty, who said she should be stoned, he said, I'll tell you what, whoever hears without sin can throw the first stone. And beginning at the eldest, because they were a little bit wiser, to the youngest, they dropped their stones and they walked away. Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And she hath no man condemned thee. And she says, no man, Lord. And Jesus says to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Changed her life forever. It had the possibility, and it did. It saved her twice that day. It saved her initially from being stoned. And it gave her the opportunity to be saved for eternity of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. When he said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. I'd be willing to believe that she never forgot those words that were spoken to her that day. Because the word of God has the power to change us. And so, church, we have got to understand that no matter what the situation is or who the individual is that the Bible uses, we all have our troubles. We've all got our struggles, and we all have our needs spiritually of God. And so God has a word for us, and he's telling us that, you know what, I'm not condemning you. I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might have life. 
So whatever our failures, whatever our faults, whatever our misery and our, our mistakes are, Jesus wants us to know that he's not condemning us, but he's providing an opportunity for us to repent and to go and sin no more, to have our sins uh, washed away in the waters of baptism through the power of his name and receive the gift of his spirit in our life because it has the power to change us. I love the story of Zacchaeus. He was not just a tax collector, but he was the chief tax collector. <laughs> he was the man over the tax collector. So if the Jews didn't like the tax collectors, they liked Zacchaeus even less. And the Bible says that he was not very tall. He was a shorter man, so he wanted to see Jesus when he heard he was coming. But as it was, usually there was a large crowd around Jesus, and he couldn't get to him. And I'm sure people were pushing him aside, saying, what are you doing here, tax collector? You don't have any part of this. Get out of here. And they, and they wouldn't let him in, and he just wanted to see Jesus. So he ran ahead, and he climbed up a tree just to see him. And when Jesus got to that place, he stopped. And he just looked up. And he says, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down and hurry because today I need to stay at your house. From that, just that invitation, just that word, here was a man, all he wanted was just to see the possibility just to cast his eyes upon Jesus, maybe just to hear a word of what he was saying as he was going by. But here he stops, he looks him face to face, he invites him to come down, and he says, I want to stay at your house. I want dinner at your house. I want to be with your family. I want to be with your friends. Can I tell somebody today that Jesus wants to be with you? He wants to be with your family. He wants to be with your children. Children. He wants to be with your friends. Zacchaeus was wealthy because the Romans paid him to collect Jewish taxes. And he was Jewish. He was a traitor in the eyes of the Israelites. But this simple invitation changed his heart so much that he generously said, I'm giving half of everything I have away to the poor. Giving half of what I had right now to the poor because it changed him. Think about that for yourself for a minute. Half of what you have, not half of what's in your wallet, not half of what's in your bank account, half of your possessions, your home, your vehicles, your clothes, your finances, your retirement, half I'm giving to the poor. And if I ever wronged anybody, I'm going to go back through the books and I'm going to see who I cheated. Because not only did they get money from the Romans, they sometimes, the, the, the Romans said, as long as you get us our percentage, you can charge them as whatever you want and keep the extra. Rome didn't care. He says, if I wronged anybody, I'm going to restore them four times, four times as much. That's how much the word of God changed him, church. And the last one I want to just share is a man named Saul. Saul was a, also a Pharisee in the New Testament. He was a religious leader. He was a student of, of the most profound teachers of their day. And he loved the Word of God, and he was very excited, and the Bible uses the word zealous about the Word of God. And so he loved God. He loved the law, the Torah, the commandments, the Sabbath, and, and all of it. He loved it so much. And when Jesus came on the scene and his disciples were following him and, and the Pharisees didn't go for all of that, he was so passionate about it. The Bible says he was there when they were stoned. He was hauling them off to prison. He was collecting them. Anybody that followed Jesus, he brought them back to be tried at the temple in front of the Pharisees. And he got papers to do it. He was covered by Jewish law to go and to collect followers of Jesus and to bring them in chains and to put them in jail and to have them beaten and to have them even killed. But in Acts 9 and 3, as he's 
journeying. He's going to Damascus. And all of a sudden, a light shines all around him from heaven. It blinds him, and he falls to the earth, and he hears a voice. And the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And trembling and astonished, he says, Lord, what will you have me to do? I'm changed forever. I'm not going to be the same after today. What do you want me to do? He instructs him to go to Ananias and, and to be baptized and filled with God's Spirit. Saul was a devout Hebrew. Saul is a Hebrew name. But we don't always refer to him as Saul, do we? We refer to him as Paul. Because we, I think, at least for myself, sometimes we get mistaken because when Simon came uh, as a fisherman and Jesus said, you're going to be called Peter from now on, and Thomas, Jesus called Didymus, and James and John, he called the sons of thunder. Jesus gave people lots of nicknames. Jesus didn't give Saul a nickname. His name was Saul. It's a Hebrew name. But he allowed God to change him so much that he stopped referring to him as Saul himself. Acts 13 and 9, it says in Saul, who is also we know as Paul, in Acts 13 and 9, from that verse on, he never is referred to again as Saul. But as Paul, Paul is a Latin name. It's a Roman name. Because that's who he was trying to reach. His life was completely changed by the words of Jesus Christ to the point where he says, I'm leaving my old identity behind and I'm going to take on a new identity that's going to allow me to minister and to reach these Gentiles. How have we allowed the word of God to change us? You know, the word mixed is only found one time in the New Testament. It means to commingle or to combine. It means a union or a mingle or to pour out. It's not just putting two things side by side. It's things being mixed together so they become one. Some things don't mix, right? Oil and water. You can stir it as much as you want. It's not going to mix. But some things do mix together and combine Together, Hebrews 4 and 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Both of them heard the word. But the word preached did not profit them, because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. You see, for the word of God to change me, I've got to mix it with my faith. That means I've got to say this is for me, and this is going to change me, and I want to live this, and I want this to be my life and my guide. There's been a lot of times where I was teaching people or speaking with them, ministering to them, trying to help them about things in the Bible, and they've asked me, well, what do you feel that God thinks about this? I remember one time I was talking with somebody very close to me, and, and at that time he was heavily involved in drugs, marijuana mainly. And uh, he says, well, I know that, that you don't believe like in smoking and, and drinking is bad, but what about pot? I mean, that's natural. God made it. Right? And I said, well, God made poison ivy too, but I'm not out rolling around in it. See, what people don't often realize is that, you know, like we talked about this morning, we didn't quite get into it, but the curse that came upon the land because of man's sin, that's where all the weeds and the garbage came from. So it wasn't part of God's original plan, right? 
There's things that because of sin we have to deal with. And sometimes when God, when there's a subject that's kind of obscure, maybe not completely outlined in the Bible because maybe in their day it hadn't come yet, but I can promise you the principle is there. Well, where in the Bible does it say God doesn't want you to go to movies and watch TV? And I know that that was, you know, sometime earlier when TV and and video and all that stuff became really popular and started coming out that the church took a stand against it. In fact, back in the day, many churches and Christians and pastors did not even have a TV. They, they preached against it. Well, where in the Bible does it say that? Well, there's a verse that says, don't put any evil thing before your eyes. So I guess if it applies, it's in there. And so then I guess you could also say, if we're not supposed to put anything evil before my eyes, then I probably shouldn't let anything evil go in my ears. Right? Because this morning we talked about worship and Lucifer being the archangel of worship. Where do you think he's going to attack you at? Man, one of the hardest things for me when I came to God was that music. All my old life and people I connected with and things I did, things I saw, things I listened to. But little by little, God's Word can change us. Amen? And people will ask, well, why did, you know, God loves us just as we are. You're right, He does. That's why He died for us. But he gave us a spirit so we wouldn't stay that way. Because if he was willing to accept just as I am into heaven, there would have been no need for the cross. Change is important. Doesn't mean God's going to rip you to shreds right away. I mean, you don't get a brand new bush and start pruning everything off of it. You let it grow. You let it develop some roots. You let it begin to bear fruit. And then sometimes you come and you prune some things off that aren't healthy, right? That's how God is. God's not into tearing us down and beating us up and making us feel bad. But little by little, as we allow God's word into our heart, it will change us. There might be some things that are hard for us to bear right at first. But I tell you what, the more I allow God to deal with me, the easier those things become. The things I dealt with when I first came to the Lord, there's a lot of pride, a lot of vanity. God dealt with that. <laughs> but you know what? The more I fell in love with Him, and the more His Word ministered to me, and the more I allowed it to change me, the more I was able to say, God, here I am. I'm yours. You bought me with a price. God, do with me what you want. So when people say, what do you think, that, what do you feel God thinks about this? Well, what I can tell you is that I cannot tell you what God is thinking at any given time. <laughs> but what I know for sure is that the answer to your question can be found in his word. So it doesn't matter what I think about anything. What it matters is what God's word says about it. And the key to allowing God's word to affect us personally you want the key to allowing God's word to affect us personally? Take it personally. It's for me. It was written for me. It was given to me. It's to bless me. It's to help me. It's to strengthen me. It's to provide for me. It's to nourish me. It's to save me. It's to wash me and cleanse me. And I have to take it personally. So when he calls for us to worship him, we need to worship him. When he tells us to read and study his word, we need to read and study it. Since he's commanded us to forsake our sin, we need to forsake it. As he's called us to love one another, we should love each other. And until we truly believe that this word is for us and we receive it personally, it'll just be another book. But when we do, it has the power to transform us. Stand together today, please. Philippians 2, 5 through 9 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God thought it not equally to be or thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made of himself no reputation he humbled himself took on the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men being found as fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even the death of the cross wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name if we could bow our heads and close our eyes his word has the power to dramatically improve and change our lives. I want you to say that to yourself in your mind right now. His word has the power to dramatically improve and change my life. So what could a dramatic improvement in your life look like? What could a dramatic improvement in your life look like? If God's Word has the power to do it, what could that look like for you? I want to encourage you that He's here today, that His Word is real, that it's truth. He's not a liar. I want it to change me every day more and more. And the reason, church, that this change is important is because it's making me more like Him. He's making me more like Him. That's what the Word of God does. It makes us more like Him. And what an incredible transformation that can be in our lives. I invite you to come. Find a place. Invite Him once again into your heart, to your life. Ask Him. Give Him permission. Say, God, I want you to change me right now. Minister to me, God. Help me and strengthen me, Jesus. For I need you, God, and I can do nothing without you. In Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's talk. Let's talk to him today. He can change the way we talk. He can change the way we think. He can change the desire of things, of places we want to go and things we want to do. He can change our hearts so we no longer want to look at the things we used to look at or entertain the things we used to entertain. He can break addictions and struggles. He can free us from oppression and spiritual bondage. He can heal us physically and bless us in every way. In Jesus' name. Come on, talk to him today. Lift up your voice to him today. Be a blessing to him and let him be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Lord, I want to give myself completely to you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Hallelujah. Yes, I give myself away so you can use me. my life. 